everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this is the Good Clash series. My name is Meg Mott, and I teach politics at Marlboro College. And um, I know that we have some new faces here uh, who didn't get to see the first two. Uh, I will always begin each session with a bit of a review. Um, but before we get started, since this is the first time, and I think Peter's right, like, you know, put on your seatbelt. Um, we're not going to crash, I don't think because um, it seems like we're all interested in figuring out how to have difficult conversations in ways that where we might actually achieve what uh, John Stuart Mill said, which is to have a clash and, and share the truth between us. Sheldon, can I put you on the spot? Because I think it was you who during the first class said, this is what he's getting at in terms of sharing the truth between the two sides. Do you mind just, am I, am I totally wrong about that? It wasn't you. So funny, I'm sure that there was some person who articulated in a totally different way. Um, so I'll keep looking like, was it you? Was it you? <laughs> just be aware, I'm looking for the person who can re-articulate what it means to share the truth between two different sides. Not as, a, not as a point of compromise in the middle, but as something far more mysterious and big. Um, Sure, with Sheldon. Okay, but um, so maybe before we get started, if everybody, and I know this is a very, very contentious issue, if you could just take a moment to say what you find, you, know, you I'm going to assume that people have a side. Maybe some of you don't have a side, and that's true, which may, will make this exercise much, much easier. But if you do have a side, if you would be willing to just say to yourself, take, we're just going to take a moment of what you find the most persuasive argument that justifies your position. Just take a moment. Now I'm going to ask you to take a moment to put into your brain this argument of the opposition that you find most persuasive. We'll just do that for a moment. The argument of the opposition you find most persuasive. Um, and just out, uh, out of curiosity, nobody has to share their viewpoint or their arguments, but how many people found that exercise easy? Yeah, a couple, a couple people. It's actually a really, uh, yeah, actually that's actually pretty good. Uh, it's a very hard exercise to do, and um, the fact that you were even willing to do that suggests that we're doing something pretty exciting together. Because how often do p groups of people come together and actually allow for that kind of um, difference in their, in their one brain? So let's go and just do a little bit of the review. And lo and behold, somebody gave me one of these things. So now I'm stepping up my technological game. Yes, I did cry a little bit about this, but let's see if it worked. Ha ha! Amazing. So just to remind us, why are we engaged in good clash? It's because good clash, says my friend Niccolo, will give us better government. And he has a whole sequence to help us understand this. This will sound very familiar for many of you. Good government arises from good education. Good education from good laws. And good laws from those clashes which so many rashly condemn. We need a good clash in order to get a good government. And one of those intermediary uh, factors, good education, I want us to think about that in old terms, old Republican terms, like the Republic of Florence. And that's not about schools and teachers. 
that's about what kind of laws do we have. Because when we live under a certain kind of laws, we're going to get a certain kind of civic education. When Tocqueville came to this country and he saw the jury system, he thought that was the best education that Americans could ever get. By going and serving on a jury, debating the issues with their peers, that was a great education. Terrible education is police brutality. That gives people a very specific understanding of what their relationship is to government, who gets protected, who doesn't. Uh, we may think of pro police brutality as targeting certain groups, but I think everybody would understand is when you see police brutality, everybody gets a little bit more afraid. And their, and their understanding of what it means to participate in a democracy changes. So when, we, when he's talking about good education, he's talking about a civic education that the population is getting because of the kind of laws we live under. So that's why, for him, it's so important that we have good laws and that those laws could come from good clashes. Uh, this is my other good friend, Aristotle. Good clash creates a wiser population. It, and I love this, and this is going to be important, particularly important when we start to move in to these three topics that we're looking at, because who are our key deliberators in the United States, the ones who engage in good clash all the time? It's members of the Supreme Court. So the people can do that job unless, he says, they are utterly degraded. And I'm going to suggest today that means not able to engage in good clash. Although individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge, and we can think of the Supreme Court, as a body they are as good or better. So when we have good clash, we may be able to make better decisions even than our professional deliberators, the Supreme Court. Although the Supreme Court is going to have a lot to do with how we talk about things. They may be the great deciders. They're also the ones who create the vocabulary for our clashes. And that's particularly true in this case, uh, abortion. So just a couple other um, sweet things from the past. And I tend to like to go to the early modern or pre-modern era. And there's a reason for that. Although maybe I'll hold my punchline till I get to my absolute favorite. But the nice thing about the early modern thinkers is they did not think of us as rational, autonomous, uh, self-interested beings. They saw us as filled with passion. And so passion was always part of the mix and understanding our passionate nature. So if you're wondering, why is Meg? I mean, here she is, lesbian, Wyndham County. Why is she always going to the dead white guys? It's because they talk about politics and passion. That's why, I'm looking for the politics and passion. So um, here's my favorite cranky person, Hobbes. Somebody want to read this one? Men are so in love with their own new opinions that they name them conscience as if they would have it seem unlawful to change the speak against them. Right. Right, and there's nothing like a strong moral argument to then make it harder to engage in good clash. Because if you're engaged in a strong moral argument, and I certainly have made them in the past against the patriarchy, if somebody starts to say something that I think has anything to do with the patriarchy, I'm gonna shut them off. In fact, I'm just gonna do this. And this is gonna be one of the key um, techniques we're gonna use as we go forward. So uh, I mentioned Spinoza last time uh, as my, the one I'm true, truly attached to. Can you see why? Oh my God, look at those eyes. This is a beautiful, beautiful uh, Sephardic Jew who was excommunicated, so he is a Sephardic heretic. And um, Spinoza has some interesting things to say about morality and our sense of good and bad. And this is a time uh, early modern era when a lot of religious conflicts and a major shift going on. Kings are losing their divine authority in the minds of thinkers, uh, Republican thinkers, people who are interested in self-government, and um, different churches are greatly at war with each other. 
about who has the one true faith. Spinoza looks at this and he says something which just drives a heart, a sword through the heart of the rabbis of Amsterdam. <laughs> we desire nothing because we judge it to be good, but on the contrary, we call it good because we desire it. And can you imagine what it was like for the rabbis of Amsterdam? The story of the, of the Jews in Europe has been terrible. The Sephardic Jews, they've been expelled from Spain. They go to Portugal. The reason they can go to Portugal is because the king likes their money, and he will take their money. Many of them have to go to the New World because uh, the conquest needs some money, and the Jews have money. They finally leave Portugal and go to Amsterdam. Amsterdam is then run by Calvinists who decide that Jews have their place in their theology. And so as long as the Jews act as Jews and don't start acting as free Dutch citizens, they're great with having a, a strong uh, Jewish center in Amsterdam that provides a lot of good commercial contacts with this emerging trade. And Spinoza, who's they're all hoping will be the great rabbi in order to help the Sephardics get back on the right path. Because when you've been on the run for a long time, you can get confused about what the faith is actually asking of you. And this is what he comes up with. <laughs> oh, that was hard. Um, and so he was excommunicated. Nobody could talk to him, nor eat with him, nor sell anything to him. But Spinoza was determined to understand human beings. And this is another little piece that he tells us. Uh, hate is increased by being returned, which when you're talking to somebody who you feel is a strong opponent to what you're saying, it's amazing how your own hate can go up. You can count on it. Sometimes people can't listen to the news because if somebody comes on the news, they feel hate because they, hate, they feel that the hate is coming at them from the person on the radio. But here's what he also says, but can be destroyed by love. Now he's no, and I don't mean this in a flippant way, he is, Spinoza is a rational person. There's elements to what he says, which is that the one true knowledge about God and the universe is that all we need to do, all religions say this, is love each other and love God. He reaches that conclusion through reason. So let's give an example of how he can come up with this conclusion. He who imagines he is loved by one he hates will be torn by hate and love together. Isn't that the most interesting piece? To put in your head that actually the person you hate, you begin to have signs that maybe they actually love you. That is going to confuse you. If you think the person you hate hates you, your hate will be rewarded back and forth, back and forth. And that may be something that's going on in terms of our partisan rhetoric right now. You can just watch the heat goes up. But if one side says they are actually love you as well, all bets are off how you're going to be feeling. You'll be very confused. Um, and then here's my last Spinoza slide. And he's, he's weighing things out. He, he, I, sometimes I think about Spinoza in terms of billiard balls. We have these balls hitting us. A love ball comes in, a hate ball comes in, a fear ball comes in. Um, would somebody like to read this first one? Given an equal cause of love, love toward a thing will be greater if we imagine the thing to be free than if we imagine it to be necessary. Yeah, so, and the, the important word here is free. Um, if the cause of love, and, and I mean, I'm sure arranged marriages work in some traditions. I'm very willing to believe that. But there's a something about the arranged marriage which can make it seem like it's not free. And, and then we might say, well, maybe there's not love to start with. When it works, my guess is you start as friends and then the love grows. But if you imagine the thing uh, to be free and freely loving and freely loving you, then um, it's going to feel greater than if we thought the person was being forced to love us. But here's, now if you take that to be true, will you take this to be true? 
And similarly for hate. If the thing that you feel hates you, if you begin to think that is determined by some other factors, you will feel less hatred. If you think the thing that hates you is acting totally freely, then you are going to take it much more personally because you are going to feel that they freely made that choice. So here's this, this is where it becomes very political and that how do we understand these feelings? Are they free things coming along, like free agents? But how much of it is actually determined by other causes? So if thinking about things as not necessarily being free when we're dealing with hatred will help us reduce hatred. Thinking about things being free when we're love will increase our love. And here's the final. Elizabeth, can you read that? When the mind considers itself and its power of acting, it rejoices and does so the more distinctly it imagines itself and its power of acting. So then we begin to watch ourselves as we're negotiating this whole confrontation, feeling the love and the hate, considering that we could love somebody who hates us and that therefore their hate will be actually diminished because they'll just get confused, and then beginning to think about who's freely acting and who's not freely acting. If we begin to understand ourselves as being part of this whole mix, we are going to feel so excited. And this is where this is this. Look at what we can do. Spinoza is most interested in how we can act as opposed to be acted upon. And there's an element of this. This is a Dutch, I figured for a Dutch philosopher. This is a Dutch sculptor, Bert Kiewit. I'm sorry, K-I-E-W-I-E-T. And it's called Deliberation. So there may be elements in that in which somebody is saying, well, maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe I should hate you because you aren't agreeing with me. Or maybe I'm afraid that you don't love me. But if we can stand back and watch the whole thing, then we get to see our power of acting. And if we can even watch ourselves in the moment of some deliberation and see what it is we're doing, we're going to get totally excited. That's what he says. So when we are having our conversations here, and we're disagreeing maybe, or we're having different viewpoints, but we're noticing ourselves having these different viewpoints, we will get very joyful. As opposed to this one. <laughs> and I found that on the web. Um, it says intransigent. And, um, but if we were to really look at those feelings, what other feelings do we see in play with these two people? Yeah, why? Nancy. Yeah. Because they're back to back. They're back to back. They're actually touching. Yeah. Right. So there may be this, but it's not like some, something happens on the radio, a voice comes on, and you see this. That's very different. This is these people are actually touching. Um, so if you could almost imagine that they're lovers and that they're having a momentary dispute, because there seems to be some calmness on their faces. Maybe, a little bit. Um, and so this may be a moment where, yes, it happens like this, but there's this closeness. So you pick down the hands, and maybe you could actually turn around. Yes, Julie. Huh. Julie said, can people, can people hear Julie, that they're thinking. This is a, fairly meditative. Just as you all, when you were thinking about your positions, first how you felt on one side, then imagining the other. We, it, that was a beautiful moment. I got to see you all just thinking. So there's a lot at play in this, even though there's this shutting down. Um, and this, um, a couple other things. So if we start to think about in terms of Spinoza, who says, do you want to read this one? How sadness works on our politics. For each one will strive always to preserve his being and to put aside sadness as far as he can. And 
Thank you, Elizabeth. And so here we have uh, the picture, and this was the echo chamber where there's the person up there at the top. Look, this device even makes, whoa. I've always wanted to be that kind of a person. So there's this person, and they are feeling um, like, oh, I got my ideas, and they come from my friends, and then the, my friends have their ideas. I, I don't know what it says down there, and it goes into media, it comes back to me. I feel very, very excited by this echo chamber I'm here. And these little red lines down here are the views of, points of view that I don't agree with, the things that I, I won't put in my head, the opposition I don't want to hear, this thing. Uh, we could understand this as something driven by the media, uh, social media or mainstream media. Uh, for Spinoza, he would say we would, should understand this as a condition of sadness. And, and for me, it's like, oh good, we got a passion back into the mix. A cause that is more about feelings than just about these other things. It may feel like they're totally outside of our control. Mainstream media, social media, whatever. He wants us to humanize it and just bring it down to sadness. And this is a way that we get to feel happier. Although if we think of, can I do this? If we think of something out here, and the human mind, it's, it's like a bird. It just goes all over the place. If, unfortunately, we think of anything down here, we are going to feel sad. So it's actually not a very stable form of joy. Because all we have to do is think outside our yellow bubble. Um, we, and just a um, couple other things. So this is the, um, there's two ways then to understand when we get into a state of, of conflict. One is, we talked about this last time, cognitive dissonance. Our identity is wrapped up in our political rhetoric. So it's not just these ideas, it's how we perceive ourselves. I am this kind of a person. We can't hear our opponents because they threaten our self-esteem. Or Spinoza would say, focus on the feelings. Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling hatred? Where is love in the mix? Can you play this feeling game and change things around? So these are, I see these as two very different. The modern are the first two. The early modern is the third. We operate on this much different level. There he is. I just have to put another picture. Um, so um, there are two, there are, oh, sorry, there's a, a very serious consequence to this. And it seems like there's a lot of people in the room who do not suffer from it. Because look at what this is. We remember the plausible arguments of our side under times of great stress when we're feeling this bad clash. We forget the plausible arguments of the other side. We forget the implausible arguments of our side. And we remember the implausible arguments of the other side. So we did that experiment for the first two. I didn't ask you, can you think of something really stupid that your side thinks? We could have done that one. And then I would have asked you, can you think of something really stupid that the other side thinks? And then the question would be, oh, what, 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 which would have been easier? And you just get to watch yourself and feel that joy of watching the brain. You know, we can laugh at ourselves. And then we feel like, oh, this is kind of fun to be a human being. Aren't we funny? <laughs> this, um, I know I'm moving rather quickly just to sort of catch, catch us up to speed, to set the stage, especially for people who haven't been here. Um, we had a question last time about what is this slide? I hadn't identified it very well. It's fewer Americans hold a mix of liberal and conservative views. If we take that experiment that we did of putting these thoughts in our head, of both sides, it would suggest by the Pew Research Center's findings that in 1994, people would have an easier time doing that um, experiment. In 2004, it would have been easier. And as we get forward, it becomes harder and harder. And I, and I remember, I think, Wesley, you said early in the, in the you, you want to jump in now about like, conservative and liberal, like these two things, they just create factions. And, and that's absolutely right. And then there's also conservative and liberal positions. Can we identify them and put them in our brain 
to sort of think through it. Think through both sides. I don't know, Wesley, if that addresses some of your concerns. It does address my concerns. I thought a lot about what I said after the class was over. Yeah. And I thought that my concern was not helpful. Oh. It wasn't helpful to me. And it wasn't helpful to what we're trying to do. So, and I don't know if that, what that's got to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so. Ah, so Wesley wants to apologize. <laughs> and did everybody hear what Wesley said that he, he thought about it? He said, well, maybe that wasn't helpful. Actually, when somebody says something that's pushing back, that's what I tend to think about a lot. And so I'm going to guess there were other people who held that viewpoint. For me, it was actually very helpful, Wesley. Because then I thought, and Peter also raised a question about, well, I don't get this slide. And I thought, well, that's because what is it when, when and I, I think what I appreciated what you were getting at is, what does it mean for us to identify others? Oh, there's a liberal. Oh, there's a conservative. As opposed to, this is a liberal argument. I'll let it get in my brain. This is a conservative argument. Now I'm going to let it get in my brain. And to, and to then sort of see what happens in that mix. So anyway, thank you. Apology refused. <laughs> Okay, um, so here, let's get to it. This is, this is what we've been waiting for. And as I said, um, we're now moving out of people and we're moving into a rarefied group of highly professional thinkers. And this is what they look like now. And the Supreme Court sets it up for a very good clash. So um, first of all, this way of setting up a Supreme Court is pretty unusual. Most countries do not have this kind of an entity. Because how many people get life tenure? I got life tenure. But hey, um, there are very few other professions in which you get life tenure. And this is one of them. Supreme Court and university professors. Are there other? Uh, teachers get tenure, life tenure. Uh, and the idea is that all these people would hang out and they would talk to each other and they would become friends. And in fact, that often has happened. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, Justice um, Antonin Scalia would go to the opera together. They tried to set it up that there would become a group of people who would actually be able to engage in good clash. Let's see, there's some other things. Um, they also have the same kind of an education. They know how to think through the Constitution. So it's not as if every single issue that comes up before them, they get to talk about in any way. No, they are parsing the grammar for constitutional logic. They also um, are hearing the same set of facts. And in one of our conversations, we talked about how important it is when you're deliberating to have the same set of facts. So town meeting does that really well. We get our town report. We know what the articles are. These people, they all get to hear the same set of facts that come before them in the briefs. And they also have the same information through oral arguments. So these are the conditions for great clash. And um, they um, also, the last piece I want to hold on to, and this is going to be very important when, we, uh, when another decision comes up about Roe. That guy right there in the middle, Chief Justice John Roberts, he is very interested in maintaining the legitimacy of the court, which means it's got to be above pure, naked politics. They wear those robes for a reason, my friends, and that is to keep the nakedness of their politics out of sight. <laughs> so this is, this, there's all these levels here where they are trying to do, they want to do good clash. They want to show us that they can. So let us, but that didn't look like that in 1973. So, okay, I'm gonna use my clicker again. That's the row court. 1973. Yes, it's all guys. 
Um, however, let's see if I can this happen. Okay. So Thurgood Marshall, an African American justice. And rumor has it, at least uh, somebody, Juan Williams just did a biography. I haven't read it yet, but it's on uh, Thurgood Marshall. And Thurgood Marshall wanted to help out Harry Blackman to write this decision. I think that's Harry Blackman. Does anybody else think differently? I think that's him. It's the glasses. Uh, and I think Rehnquist is a little taller, so I'm guessing that's Re Rehnquist. Um, and who's that? Is that uh, Warren Berger? Yeah, because he's right there sitting in the center, Chief Justice. And where is Douglas? I'm going to guess that's Douglas was a bit older at the time, so I'm going to guess that's Douglas. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's Blackman. I'm still trying to figure out the glasses. No, I think you were right. Think I was right? Okay, that this is Blackman. Um, and Blackman is the one who uh, writes the decision in Roe v. Wade. Uh, Brennan is there as well. I think that's Brennan. Brennan is a Catholic. You might think he was not behind um, the Roe court. He is. He was. It was uh, Brennan, I gather, who came up with go with viability. Don't talk about three months. Because when uh, Bre oh, sorry, Blackman first penned it, he said abortion should only be permissible for the first three months. Brennan said, don't do that, go with viability. And he was using Catholic natural law reasoning to do that, which is, goes back to Aquinas, life begins at quickening. And so then he upped it to modern medicine and said, go with viability. And Blackman, uh, I'm sorry, Thurgood Marshall is also interesting. Um, and Steve, if at any point you, you want to jump in on some of these discussions, please feel free. Steve Wong has written an uh, amazing play about uh, the abortion debate and someday the theater near us, we hope to be able to see it. And a lot of these ideas, he shared it with me. Um, so um, it's helped me to think through some of these, so hoping you'll jump in. Um, the African American community in abortion is very, very mixed because um, racial genocide and abortion has a nasty history. Thurgood Marshall, however, according to Juan Williams' biography supported this decision. And he had seen how many African American women had suffered with illegal abortions. But that's, that's our group. These are a group of decision makers. They heard the facts. And um, let's start to look at what the issues were that they were interested in. They frame it in a very specific way. Are state laws banning abortion unconstitutional. It's not, is abortion good or bad? It's not, when does life begin? It is a constitutional question. And it's always great when you're having a big clash in a country with a lot of different opinions to have something that you can all look to. And this is what we have. And it's so short. I mean, what a piece of cake. And it's, um, it covers so much that gives us a chance of having a good clash. Um, anybody want to read this? Texas statute prohibited physicians from performing abortions except for the purpose <coughs> of saving the mother's life. And I think there were a couple other states as well who got involved in this class action suit. But we're really looking at very specific statutes to see if those very specific statutes are unconstitutional. Somebody want to read this one? Unmarried pregnant women and others brought a class action suit challenging constitutionality of statutes. Right. Um, and so what, anybody have a, uh, any sense of what part of the Constitution they may have been cons using to bring a case? Have any constitutional geeks in here? Yes, um, Judy. I, this is probably not right, but I think the state, in order to uh, make a statute, has to find a viable interest in its rational basis. In the rational basis, yes. right? 
And so the state was asserting that there is a rational basis for it to make a law concerning this issue. Right. So did everybody hear, Judy, that uh, every state, in order to pass a law, has to have what they call a rational basis. There has to be some reason why the state should do what it's doing. Yeah. They can't just do something willy-nilly. Um, and yes, so that's true. The, the burden is going to be on the state to prove it has a rational basis. However, what are the plaintiffs going after to say this is unconstitutional? So I'm going to let you know. Anybody want to throw out an amendment, maybe? Privacy issue. Anybody know where that is in the Constitution? Shoshana says it's not in the Constitution. We have a problem. We have a theory and we don't have any language. Shoshana says would it be equal protection under the law? You know what amendment that is? This is part of your civic Four education. Fourteenth. Absolutely right. Oh, I wish I, next time I'll bring little chocolates. When I'm teaching constitutional law, I like to throw a little, con you know, like, yeah, let's get some uh, constitutional education happening here. The 14th would be equal protection under the law. And that, and we're going to hear about this, might have been a good way to go. They didn't go that way. They went much more with the privacy, and this is where they found it. A three-judge district court guaranteed, granted declaratory relief, holding that the statutes infringed on plaintiffs' rights protected by the Ninth Amendment. Everybody know their Ninth Amendment? It's a strangest amendment. Look at it. Somebody want to read this one? The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny and disparage others retained by the people. What? Yes, so this is an anti-amendment. If it's stated, in the Constitution, such as freedom of press, freedom of religion, free speech, right to a jury, uh, you need probable cause in order to get a warrant. You've got all these rights, people, and they're laid out for you and clutch them to your bosom when you leave your homes. It, all those other rights that aren't enumerated, those are protected by the Ninth. So there we have this understanding that we have this protection <laughs> but you can't say it. You'll know it when you see it, maybe, but you can't say it, because it's not enumerated. It's unenumerated. So Blackman seizes, and this is something that the uh, plaintiffs bring. They say, go with the Ninth Amendment. We need our right to privacy. And it had started to be building. I mean, there's good reasons they went with the Ninth. All the birth control, birth control cases, they relied heavily on the Ninth Amendment. So Blackman hears this argument and he seizes on it to do what he feels is right. The Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. So he gives that strange, vague language everything that's necessary in order to find the decision that he feels is right. And then William Douglas, I know somebody else said, so what does Douglas say? Well, he takes it to the moon and um, gives it even more uh, texture. Somebody want to read this? Autonomous control of the development and expression of one's intellect, interests, tastes, and personality. Yeah. So what might have been, some, where some people was just keep the government away, is now being framed as a positive right. You have all these rights. Um, autonomous control being a very key term. And this one. Freedom of choice in the basic decisions of one's life respecting marriage, divorce, procreation, contraception, and the education and upbringing of children. And that line, freedom of choice, then becomes the beginning of a movement that when Roe starts to be um, pushed against freedom of choice, they, that people go to uh, Douglas's language and, that, and to create that. He also, um, I didn't put it up here, he also said it in the same, it's not the decision itself, it's a, concur a concurring decision. Free to care for one's health and person. Freedom from bodily restraint or compulsion, 
And this is my favorite, freedom to walk, stroll, or loaf. <laughs> so, for those of you who are feel like you're getting pushed along the sidewalk too much, you could just cite Roe v. Wade. I have freedom to loaf. I have freedom to hang out. I have, maybe I don't have freedom to loiter because there may be rational basis for an ordinance to be passed that says, no, you can't loiter, but you can loaf. An officer, this is loafing, not loitering. <laughs> so just look at the row decision and you'll understand, I have this right. <laughs> so that was what the majority, these are two uh, opinions, but there is a dissent, and, and, and I'm wondering, uh, anybody can or cannot may decide, oh yeah, this was what I found to be a reasonable, persuasive argument for either the opposition or for my side, because it's a really important argument that Justice White makes. Somebody want to read Justice White? I find no constitutional warrant for imposing such an order of priorities on the people and the legislatures of the states. If you can keep going, Jean. The issue should be left with people and to the political process. The people have devised to govern their affairs. Yeah, right? Why is this going to the Supreme Court? We have a democracy. Shouldn't people be able to figure this out in their states? And this, these are state statutes. What about states being able to have some sort of autonomy Freedom of choice themselves. Are we getting rid of the states? Is that what this new thing is? Yes, individuals have freedom of choice. They have autonomous control, but states don't. Um, and White has a point, and many people say, like, wow, you kind of rushed the, you should have let the political process go the way it did, because um, look at how abortion laws were starting to change, even before Roe. If it's a dark, Colored, that means they repealed their anti-abortion laws. If it's a lighter pink, that means they were reforming them. So in places, and look at, especially at the southeast, reform was starting to happen. And it was happening through political process. Now, if you were pregnant and you were in a bad situation and it was 1973, uh, for those of us who were teenagers or whatever in the 70s, I remember many friends needing to go to New York. And that felt like a really rough situation. Because for a while, that was the only place in New England, or Northeast, where you could go and get a legal abortion. So that was, yeah, a big deal. And there was this movement that was starting to happen. Although, you know, it's interesting how Vermont is there. I was told that Vermont never had strict anti-abortion laws. But uh, this map makes me want to reconsider. I don't know if anybody has that fact. Um, uh, I'm thinking that we'll go like just a couple more slides and then we're going to take a break. Um, are you guys OK? We're starting to move in that. Uh, so um, Roe was, after it happened, a lot of people were super happy. But many people, some of them who are current Supreme Court justices, or a current Supreme Court justice, said, this is terrible. Why aren't you going through the political process? Why aren't you letting the people deliberate? Why aren't you having good clash? Why aren't you doing that kind of good education? Why has the court just jumped the gun and taken away everyone's decision making? So here's a test. Oh, Steve already knows the answer. I want you to guess who said this. Somebody want to read it? Roe, well, I believe, would have been more acceptable as a judicial decision if it had not gone beyond the ruling on the extreme statute of the court. So that means if they had just looked at the Texas law and, and, um, and really focused on the problem of the Texas law and made a change just to the Texas law rather than throwing out all anti-abortion statutes, um, they could have created a lot uh, less problems for themselves. And if you could keep going, Janice. Heavy-handed judicial intervention was difficult to justify and appears to have provoked, not resolved compromise. Yeah. Let me guess who said that. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Where's my chocolate? <laughs> yes. And is it David? Philip. No, Charles. Philip. Philip, I'm sorry, Philip. 
Um, yeah, Philip's right. This is, uh, this is RBG. There she is. Yay. Um, and RBG uh, would have followed Shoshana's advice had she been a uh, god of the universe at that moment. She would not have made a Ninth Amendment case. She would have made an equal protection case. And she also probably would have gone slower. Try to build, build, build. This is what the uh, NAACP did fairly successfully in terms of schools uh, and school desegregation. And they really wanted to go slow, slow. That was Thurgood Marshall, go slow. And then eventually a situation arose, and it became clear that they were going to go for Brown versus Board of Education. But they had a long, long plan. They went through higher ed, they went through med schools or law schools, and then eventually they got to the really, really hot one, which is uh, school desegregation. Here's another pro-choice critic. So here's somebody else, uh, Cass Sunstein of University of Chicago, who also believes in a pro-choice paradigm. However, he says, uh, Myra, you want to read? The court decided too many issues too quickly. The court should have allowed the democratic processes of the states to adapt and to generate sensible solutions that might not occur to a set of judges. Yeah. So we, we tend to rush in the United States to having the professionals take our problems and, and hope that they're going to solve it on the way we want them to, as opposed to risking going through more democratic ways. Uh, so I want to give you one other criticism of Roe. Uh, this is kind of like my Hobbes guy, my modern day Hobbes guy. He, Akil Reed Amar, he's a Yale law professor. And he said, that the individualist reading of privacy in Roe, and um, there's a lot of other cases that rely on an individualist reading of the Ninth Amendment, is anachronist, anachronistic. Anachronistic, thank you, anachronistic. What do you mean an individualist? So the, when we look at the Ninth, thank you, Shoshana. So when we look at the Ninth Amendment and we say the rights of the people that have not been enumerated anywhere else, should not, just because they haven't been enumerated doesn't mean they should be denied. So we have this broad term, the rights of the people. And the Roe decision and the birth control decisions before them saw those as individual rights. So the rights of the people, they said the rights of persons. And this crabby guy from Yale, who I totally love because he's just like Hobbes, he's really gonna look at the words, and say what are the words, Rights of the people is different than rights of individuals. And this is what he says the ninth protects us for. Somebody want to read uh, Amar? Hmm. To see the Ninth Amendment as a palladium of counter-majoritarian individual rights is to engage in anachronism. <laughs> I yes. Understand what I just read. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and can can you read one more? The ninth protects the right to overthrow the government when it breaks the social contract. Ah. Oh, okay. And this will be important when we go to the guns debate. So the way Akil Reed Amar understands this is not that we all have these individual rights. He does not see the Ninth Amendment as allowing individual rights to walk, to stroll. To loaf, no, 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 no. To be able to make all these sort of choices about yourself as if you were a totally autonomous creature. No, 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 that's not what he sees. He sees this, and he's, he's a historical thinker. Um, he sees this as when the government breaks the social contract, when all of a sudden, and maybe people will start to feel that way from time to time, they feel like, this whole thing that we did of being willing to be governed, we gave you all sorts of things, O oh government, because in governing us, you are supposed to protect our rights. But if we start to feel like that very basic social contract, the basis of a democracy, is off, well, the rights of the people underneath the ninth are the right to rebel, the right to revolt, the right to pick up arms and say, King George, you're out of here, or whoever, you're out of here. Wesley. I just want to be sure that 
you understand. So he's complaining that uh, the argument of Roe v. Wade trivializes the Ninth Amendment. Is that correct? So Wesley's asking if he's arguing that Roe v. Wade trivializes the Ninth Amendment. And I think, you know, he would probably say yes. Um, it is trivializing it in the sense of taking something that was robust, historical, and part of the entire mix. That when you have a social contract to have a self-governing community, this is the key piece. And turning it into something that is very, okay, he's not going to say bourgeois, but I'm going to say bourgeois. And I don't know if when you mean trivial, you mean concern with the self, concern with one's private life. Yeah, I think, uh, I think if that's what you mean by trivialized, I think Amar would agree. But it was necessary at the time because people couldn't figure out another way to throw out these statutes unless they, because they didn't feel like they were going to have any success in the states. So, uh, yes, Steve. Well, as, you know, that first map that you showed. Yeah. Uh, the thing to add to that is that I don't, I'm not sure about um, Vermont, uh -huh. but before 1970 or 69, uh, there were anti-abortion statutes almost everywhere, it, it, which hadn't existed in the 19th century. They had begun at the very end of the 19th century, and the AMA was very important in that, and it had grown. And then at the end of the 60s, a number of states, one after another, were changing the laws to um, in the direction of allowing more uh, abortions. So what, what, what Ruth Bader Ginsburg is pointing to is that there was a process underway, a, an active process. It was happening it, it's, uh, every year. There were more and more states. And so the thing that you are pointing to doesn't have to do with pro or anti-abortion, it's really about the question of uh, good clash, about the uh, democratic process. Did everybody hear, Steve, that there was this history? In the beginning, there weren't all these anti-abortion uh, statutes. In, you were saying in the 1800s? In the late 1800s, they began to have more and more, and it was, it was driven um, by some particular individuals, but it was driven a lot by doctors having power. Yeah, and, and so these statutes start to appear driven by doctors who, um, for, for a variety of reasons, who had power, who were wanting to uh, create some parameters around what was allowed and what wasn't allowed, and maybe who could do it and who couldn't, I'm also guessing. So th then things start to shift as there is this grassroots movement. So there was a, a strong, and there's a great book called The, How Sorry, the Hollow Hope, which looks at many Supreme Court cases and says, boy, shouldn't have gone to the Supreme Court because things were starting to move in a much more democratic way. And by going to the Supreme Court, everything went crazy. We have a hand over here, yes. Is it, did you have your hand up? No, oh, I'm looking at you, yeah. Well, I'm concerned because we're forgetting that in 1965, if you lived in Connecticut, you were Massachusetts, Exactly. And, and can you remind me your name? Nancy. Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so, um, right. And the, pen, the, bill, the pill came out in 1960. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it came out. But doctors were very alarmed Right. Uh, because 
they literally could not just go to Des Moines, Iowa and get an abortion. Right, right, they exactly. They get buses and underground work for these women way up into the 1970s. Right, right. So Nancy's reminding us just how urgent it felt. But could you wait for the democratic process? No, that's right. What I'm yes. These are men that don't know what that feels like. So, so Nancy is saying, you know, that there there need there was this urgency. We could couldn't wait for things to go state by state. We looked at what the men on the Supreme Court looked like. Who knows what the state legislators looked like? And Nancy's also talking about an underground method for getting people where they needed to go. So, one of the best colleges in the country, they had to go underground. Yeah. Right. My father was a doctor, I'm, and I was married to a minister. I know that abortions happen, yeah. but it was all very secret. Yeah. So it was all underground. Uh, Myra has her hand up, and then, I, then we're going to have, we may take a break and then come back, or maybe you want to have a little bit more hands up and then take a break. Exactly. What? Hands up. hands up. Great. Myra. Question. When did religion enter the picture? Huh. Uh, Myra wants to know when did religion enter the picture? He and talked about uh, in, the eight, in the 19th century, it was positions, right? When did religion enter this um, discussion? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I did mention, for me, I think religion's always part of the discussion. Um, uh, the story of the pill and the, uh, and the, this is a controversial. Uh, discussion, but the, the guy who invented the pill was a Catholic who felt that he was following natural law. So there's always, people are always going to use different things to justify what they're trying to do, and, and religion is always a great way to uh, come up with a moral framework about something about life and death. So, I mean, I would say it's always going to be part of it. But you're, that was maybe not the answer. I'm going to go to Steve. Well, yes. A specific answer for that is that is that um, uh, originally, actually, the Catholic Church was not anti-abortion, mm. uh, but the Catholic Church became more anti-abortion at the beginning of the 20th century. But evangelical churches were not involved at all um, until um, there was a. Uh, a case, I don't remember exactly, it, it had to do with states' rights and, the, even, and rights of the church. And evangelicals realized that the anti-abortion argument was one that they could use. And it was, so it wasn't until really the late 60s and the beginning of the, actually in the early 70s that the evangelical movement uh, a lot led by um, a man named Schaefer, um, became strongly anti-abortion. Um, and, and they were not before that anti-abortion. I, I, and I'm almost wondering, you know, as Steve is like laying out some of this interesting history, uh, when does hate become useful in terms of building up power and hating something and saying that others are wanting this? Really, because they are evil people. Uh, this is where the um, understanding the affects can be super helpful and starting to watch how that starts to play out. Um, yeah, Thad, and there was also a hand over here. So first to Thad, and then we'll go over there. Uh, first off, uh, Kennedy was asked how, about how he felt about this. And he said, <coughs> even though I'm a Catholic, and I would advise anybody in my family or people that I knew well not to have an abortion that I would support the majority rule in the United States. I was in the early 60s. I was in Washington at the time, but the closest time for this real debate was Bork. The uh, biggest argument to keep Bork out of the uh, Supreme Court was that he strenuously believed in states' rights. So that if you went to a place like this, Mississippi, where they're predominantly Catholic, you could say that even the rhythm method was illegal and therefore not have any rights at all. And that was the biggest argument to, to get to Well, that's how Thomas got in, was he got forked. So Thad reminds us, too, another moment in Supreme Court history when um, uh, Robert Bork, who's been nominated for the Supreme Court, now we have this verb, somebody gets borked. It means they don't pass the Senate. And it was a highly politicized 
um, Senate confirmation hearing, almost as politicized, and Clarence Thomas becomes the next person, and that becomes its own kind of politicized. But Thad's reminding us that the reason he didn't stand a chance was because he was such a proponent of states' rights. And so people were thinking, wow, what's going to happen around women's reproductive rights in places, uh, some of these states down here where they don't have a chance? And we had one hand here, yeah. This discussion reminds me of a couple of things. One is uh, in the 60s, I remember so many people dying because of infections related to abortions done in, you know, in these clinics that were not in any way prepared to take care of it. They, weren't, they didn't have good sterile techniques. And I went to medical school in the 1960s in New York State, and I remember our class going to Planned Parenthood, I think it was in 1964, and kind of having a, a discussion about what they offered in Planned Parenthood. And at that point, uh, it was legalized to have abortions in the mid-60s in New York State. So I didn't even remember that, uh, that particular little trip to Planned Parenthood uh, as, a, as a medical school class. Wow. Uh, until right now. Wow. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, it, is it, this map can take that you back into memories about like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden states were super, super important where you lived and where you could get to. Yeah, Sheldon. Uh, go back a little further in history. After World War II, people went to Cuba for their abortions. That's right. Yeah. And uh, in the 1950s, there was a doctor in Pennsylvania who did abortions for $40. The illegal abortions were $400 or more. So many people knew, and the doctor in Pennsylvania did it openly and was constantly being arrested in jail. And when he got out, he would resume a practice where he would commit abortions for $40. Wow. So Sheldon is, is talking about two things, and one is the first way out right after World War II was to go to Cuba where you could procure an abortion. And then talking about a doctor in Pennsylvania who would continuously do abortions for $40 even though he kept getting arrested. And how people, people were, you know, this is like this map, and, and this begins, thank you Nancy, with starting to put some real lives onto that map of many, many people and what they had to do in order to deal with the circumstances they were in. So this is like, yes, we could talk about good clash and local democracy and how wonderful that is. Certainly that's an aspiration. And then at the same time, what are people doing on the ground and what kind of options do they really have? And did the Supreme Court seem like, yes, that's the way we have to go? So let's take a quick break, if that's OK, and then we'll come back and and get into more of these details. Um, okay, so I want to push us through a little bit what the Supreme Court was saying. I'm almost done with the Supreme Court section, and then we want to get down to what is the clash looking like on the streets right now. Do we have good clash on the streets, or what are we looking at in terms of uh, the, abortion, uh, the abortion debate and where it could be going? So um, one of the things I said earlier is, what, is that the Supreme Court one of its key concerns is to maintain its legitimacy. And the way it maintains its legitimacy is by taking previous cases strongly uh, to heart. So uh, when Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood versus Casey came up to the Supreme Court, that was a 1992 case. Sorry, let me use this. Um, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the opinion. Somebody want to read this? Some of us, <coughs> excuse me, some of us as individuals find abortion offensive to our most basic principles of morality, but that cannot control our decision. Yeah, you want to keep going? Our obligation <coughs> is to define the liberty of all, not to mandate our own moral claim. So, so here is Sandra Day, and um, First of all, she's, she's wanting to do what justices want to do, which is not present themselves as moral arbiters. Even, and I say even, oftentimes um, you would say that would be a conservative position. Justices want to show themselves as being constitutional arbiters. And given what was decided in Roe, that means that 
uh, liberty and the way Douglas talked about liberty in particular is now something the court needs to take seriously. So here you have uh, a Supreme Court justice trying to thread that needle again to say, I, we know a lot of people are not happy with this. We don't know how it's playing out in terms of states. And this is going to be big when we get to capital punishment. Um, what do states want? And when I say states, I mean small democracies. And then what is afforded through Supreme Court decisions? And oftentimes, those are at odds. And because we're a constitutional democracy, that means we're going to have cognitive dissonance. So how can we convict a murderer? So how can we convict a murderer in terms of? If we're not using some moral code. Oh, so David is wondering, how do we convict a, a murderer if we're not using some moral code? The difference between a moral code, perhaps, and a legal code is that the people have said that murder is wrong, as opposed to murder is wrong. A law says the people, the legislative body, has decided that X is wrong. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting to dismiss morals. We are moral beings. I'm wanting us to see how, when we're at, at the level of the law, we're looking for constitutional reasons. And a Supreme Court justice needs to find constitutional reasons to back what they're doing. So I want to then get at one other key piece. And this is the real sticking piece. We talked a lot about um, states and states' rights and, the, and how democracy is an important value. So being able to have good clash in the states is going to be key. But here's one other criticism of Roe. And it's the one that is um, whether, whether uh, Justice O'Connor is right that it really is a question of liberty for all. Because the minute you make that claim, you do have a problem, right? So let's hear, let this guy tell us what it is. Is it a question of liberty? Or is it a question of personhood? Anybody would be willing to read Michael Paulson? The whole question. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to take it over there. Yep. Okay, the, the question on which every other aspect of any legal analysis necessarily depends is whether the unborn human fetus or embryo is a member of the human family to whom the state <coughs> may or perhaps must provide basic protection of the laws including protection of his or her right to life as against private violence. So here is, and this is a question that as we, as we put our thoughts in our brain, this, we have to make room for this one. And there's not just because this guy said so, but if we're talking about personhood in the United States, we have a problematic history of what constitutes a person. <laughs> And the Supreme Court has been one of the bodies that create um, confusion about what personhood is. Dred Scott decision, um, which happened right before the Civil War, many would argue that's what propelled us into the Civil War because so many people were so angry with the Supreme Co Court, Justice Taney, I guess is how they pronounce it, of St. Louis, Missouri, decides that even if somebody who had been a slave becomes free, that is not something that is going to be recognized as a constitutional right. Because the Constitution never saw African Americans as persons. That's the way he interpreted it. And there are elements where those two arguments butt up against each other. And maybe will cause some con you know, cognitive dissonance, particularly in the mind of people on the left, of, OK, that's not a person. I'm making that claim. That is not a born. That's not protected under the 14th Amendment. The, all those born in the United States, you don't get that kind of protection under the 14th Amendment, because you're not born yet. And then to start to say, well, then what constitutes getting the rights of a citizen? When are we going to draw that line? And then we get into all sorts of questions about what kind of language are we going to use? Are we going to say fetus? Are we going to say embryo? Are we going to say unborn child? And, it, and it's going to cause some cognitive dissonance. We should count on it. Yes? And don't we get into religious conversations at this point? Right. And so don't we get into religious conversations? Yes, we could. 
or we get into liberty conversations. Who gets state protection? And, and you'll notice I'm going to keep kind of pushing us a little bit to the constitutional side because that's the primary game we play here in the United States. Separation of church and state. And, um, uh-oh, I, I just did a whole lot of, sometimes I have a brain gap. Is it Alice? No, it's not. It's, it's Anne. Anne. I knew it. it was, I knew it was an A, Anne. Uh, <laughs> Anne is saying that uh, we have separation of church and state. Um, again, I'm always a little suspicious of trying Oh, maybe this isn't helpful. Um, we will tell ourselves things that we need to say in order to support our positions. Just want to throw that out there. And so sometimes we may find ourselves grabbing a religious truth because it supports our position. And sometimes we may want to push it away because it creates problems for our positions. And, and I'm, I'm holding on that both people do that. That's exactly what we do. And, and in, in terms of this argument, I'm going to, because I'm, my guess is we're going to be having this argument in the states. I may be wrong, but it wouldn't surprise me if, again, this goes back to the states. And what kind of strategies can we use in order to have good clash? And if we go to religious grounds and start using words like conscience, we're running into Hobbes's problem. We will reduce our chance for good clash. Um, so, because this is what we had, and this is where we're at. If I could do Photoshop, I'd have them each like this. <laughs> and Nancy's point, like, how close are they? They're not close. They're not that close. But they're kind of close. <laughs> they're kind of close. And hey, they're talking. Nobody's actually doing this. <laughs> right? They're just, ah, on either side. It's not what you call good clash, but it's definitely, it's clash. Um, and what we don't want to have happen, and there's a number of cases I could pick, but I went with this one because it's local. Um, when it gets bad clash, it looks like this. And here is John Salvi, of, uh, who went into two Planned Parenthood offices in Boston. Two receptionists were killed. Five people were seriously injured. Uh, I think he used the insanity defense. This happens, and people think, wait a minute. And, and we've had other violent occurrences that have happened. So it's one thing to be in the public sphere and making your shouting, not listening, right, but shouting, and another thing when it turns into uh, somebody gets shot. Um, so when this happened in Boston, and uh, this is probably what made me be able to even bring the abortion debate to us, because um, if we didn't have anything like this, if there, were just, if there was nobody who wanted to find some way to, ha to share the truth between the two sides, as John Stuart Mill suggested, um, I'd be a little nervous, I think, doing this all on my um, but there's, other, there's many other people who are interested in how we can um, figure out. So here are six leaders from the pro-choice and pro-life movements who decide to meet in private, and that feels very important to start, uh, to find a way forward. It was called, even though they meet in private, the Public Conversations Project. And they had some ground rules, not unlike what we were talking about last week in terms of deliberation. Uh, you need to have ground rules in order to get people to come together. And uh, Anne, your question about religion, and there was somebody else at the break who wanted to sort of say, what, what do we do going forward? Um, a lot of questions about how does religion play a role in this? So let's see what their ground rules are. Somebody want to read that? Communicate openly with our opponents from the polarizing spotlight media coverage. Yeah, and why do you think that would be important? Because here, I mean, isn't this ironic? I'm asking the public to have a conversation about a very, very difficult topic that we obviously have strong feelings about. Why would it might, why might it be better for us not to do it here? But, and we got cameras here. We're doing this in public. 
Why might it be better for us to do it private? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. One, of course, is the polarizing the spotlight of the media, you know, picking up on every sound bite that comes out of it. But you just talked about feelings. You're talking about feelings, and people have to feel vulnerable and safe in order to talk about their feelings. And you can't do that when the camera's there or people or borders. I don't think. Yeah. So, so Janice said the one piece is um, that if it's in public, the media will take it and will just pull out a section and then run with it. Mm -hmm. So you, you feel like, we're, what happened to what I was trying to say? And then Janice's other point is that feelings. If we really want to get the feelings involved, that's is a very hard thing to do in public. It's very hard to do it when you have a when it's all being hap happening through a bullhorn. You have to have create a safe space. You have to create a safe space when other people are there. Right, right. Janice is saying you have to have a, a safe space. Lynn. Well, I mean also there's there's yeah possibility of zero in on one on one thing that comes out of it and ignore the rest. So the, Lynn is saying that it's so easy just to zero in on one thing and then you ignore everything else. And, and Lynn, I was thinking about something you said in the last discussion we had about your father. So it, it's kind of interesting. We're doing something public-private here. The fact that Lynn was able to tell us a story about her father and race and, and your grandchild suggests that there may be even ways that we're starting to not, I don't want to overplay this, but when people are able to start tell their stories, that's going to be a good thing. Um, yeah, I, yes. There is a camera here, and I want to make a distinction between this type of camera and the media camera, which is just answering to get clicks, right? Yeah. The media is really about clicks, and they're laughing all the way to the bank, both Fox News and CNN. Right. Um, so what we're interested in is having conversations with yeah. productive. Yeah, so Joe is, is talking about, yes, we have cameras, but this is not media cameras. This is for us to create something that then we can share with others as opposed to getting lots of clicks. And Joe is saying everybody, Fox and CNN, are trying to just get their, their way to the bank through all these clicks. Um, yeah, we're, we're you know, yes, Pat. Plus, if you're a leader of one of the factions, you don't really have the freedom publicly to explore the outside. Yes. Pat says, if you're a leader of a faction, you don't have the, what did you say, authority? Freedom. The freedom, thank you. You don't have the freedom to explore the other side. And look at what they're after. They want to build relationships of mutual respect and understanding. They really want to understand. Um, and they want to help de-escalate the rhetoric of the abortion controversy. You can only do that if you're getting into the feelings, if you're not just grandstanding, and to risk to reduce the risk of future shootings. Future shootings. What? So, that, Steve, do you want to jump in on some of the? No, she she said it, 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 the shooting was in '94. So this this, this is after '94. Right after yeah, so it's they, they met for six years. Mm -hmm. Right. right. They, they were planning to meet for a very short period of time, and they got so interested in the discussions that they went on man meeting for years. Was this in Boston? And this was in Boston. Yeah. Um, they finally outed themselves in a Boston Globe piece, and and I'll have some uh, uh, facts about that. But just to set there, um, a couple other things they set in terms of their rules, because establishing ground rules is going to be key for good clash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen unless there's, there. it's certainly not going to happen through the media. I think we could all agree on that. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to happen through people putting down their hands off their ears and then trying to understand the other. Um, they, and here's a key one. I, I love it. Right? The aim is not to end for the common ground. Let us not assume we're all going to agree. Let us say, please don't shoot me. You know, sometimes that's where you go. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to agree me, with me. But let's not take this to the level of violence. Uh, which is a big deal because abortion has a violent edge to it. There's lots of good reasons, I'm not judging, 
I'm just wanting to say that is an element of it. So we're want, we're not, I'm not saying that we're going to live lives without violence. No. And on all three of these, uh, the guns and the capital punishment which come next, violence is part of the mix. However, can we talk about it and not shoot each other and not assume that everyone's going to think the same way? So here were the other... Um, Okay, this is very specific ground rules. Use terms, acceptable, at least tolerable to all participants. Well, you can imagine a lot of time was spent on, how are we going to describe this thing? Fetus, embryo, unborn child. They had to work that out amongst themselves. What, how could the terminology become shared? So not common ground, but common terms, I'm tempted to say. Do not interrupt, grandstand, or make personal attacks. So don't treat the other as they. Be willing to treat each person as complex human being. And this is getting to, I think, um, it was Pat's point about freedom. Speak independently, not as representatives of organizations. Because there's nothing like feeling like you're representing an ideology, or a faction, or a group, or somebody you're concerned about. And this is something I notice, at least with the, people, the students I'm working with now, a real compulsion to speak on behalf of the um, disenfranchised. But they suggest don't do that. Don't get complicated. Stay with yourself. And then maintain complete conf confidentiality unless all agree a way to go public. So there's no expectation that there's going to be an end. There's just this idea we're going to try this. We're going to try and meet each other, try and understand each other. In 2001, this is what. Um, so they started get gathering, right, the, the violence is in 1994, right after they start to meet, and in 2001 they go public. Talking with the enemy, it's a short piece, you can find it online from the Boston Globe. And the, um, I didn't put their names on the screen, but it is six women, Ann Fowler, Nikki Nichols Gamble, Francis X, Hogan, Melissa Kogut, Madeline McComish, Barbara Thorpe. Brave people. Mm -hmm. And this was in the Boston Globe in 2001. Um, somebody want to read this first quote? When we face our opponents, we see her dignity and goodness. So uh, remember how we talked about Jane Addams, I think it was in the first and the second, about looking for the preciousness in your opponent's point of view. You really have to be looking for that preciousness. That means treating that person as somebody uh, who has dignity and who has goodness. Somebody else want to read this? Embr embracing this apparent contradiction stretches us spiritually and intellectually. Huh. So here we have, rather than cognitive dissonance, which might have us slowing, shutting ourselves off and engaging in self-justification, this activity, like meditation, could be good for our spirit. To put the opposing point of view inside our head, treat it with dignity, and then let the neurons just relax. See what happens. Somebody else want to read this? It has made our thinking sharper <clears throat> and our language more precise. And I thought this one was fascinating. That in, and this goes back to what John Stuart Mill said. Why do we engage in debate? Why do we engage in good clash? Because it will strengthen our own position. And here is a strengthening that f goes down to the level of language. And, and for those of us who are interested in language, and I like the law because it's word-based, I can think about these words, 
I can be careful with what words I use. I can think about the pressure of putting these words into legal use and what the outcomes might be. This kind of activity that they're describing is, is asking all of us, talk about a civic education, to be much more careful with our language. Be a good thing. Like, careful what you eat, careful how you say things. Here's some more. Um, somebody want to read from here on, on that side of the room? We are more knowledgeable about our political opponents. Yeah. Somebody else from over there. We have learned to avoid being overreactive and disparaging to the other side and to focus instead on affirming our respective causes. Yeah, so it turns out that one can put energy into one's own sense of what's right and wrong without reacting to the other side. And that's where I, I find Spinoza so helpful. Because that overreaction, if you begin to think, oh, well, the reason they're saying that is they don't agree with me, therefore they must hate me, and therefore I hate them, and you just watch that going back and forth. Well, if we turn it into, oh, I love who you are, I may not agree with how you're characterizing the problem, but I love who you are. All of a sudden, that overreaction is going to stop happening. The emotional physics of it. And this one, uh, somebody in the back over there, putting people on the spot. That's my most fun thing. <laughs> While well, learning to treat each other with dignity and respect, we all have become firmer in our views about abortion. Wow. So it turns out that this interaction does not um, dissolve the difference. It does not become kumbaya. <laughs> However, it becomes, I would say, a great clash. And that maybe through just that level of care with language, we could get some good policy. That's my hope. Um, and uh, Steve I didn't know about, I, I knew about a lot of these things. Uh, those of you who have come to my Debating Our Rights talks, uh, some of these slides you've recognized from the Ninth Amendment discussion that we had at the Putney Library. Uh, but this is somebody I hadn't heard about, um, Francis Kissling. Who do you want to read this one? The need to approach others with enthusiasm for difference is absolutely critical to any change. I'm the toughest of fighters. I love a good fight, and I love to win. Yeah. Uh, she, I, this I got from an interview with uh, Krista Tippett on Being. Uh, and she used to be head of the Catholics for Choice, and now she's head of the President of Health, Ethics, and Social Policy. And she's one of these people who's decided we need to actually talk to the other side, not just vilify the other side. And I love this part. She, like Jane Addams, is a fighter, wants to debate, loves the game of debate, wants to win at debate. At the same time, there's a difference between that and um, just wanting to dominate. Um, somebody want to read this one? Janice. You have got to approach differences with this notion that there is good in the other. Yeah. And, and this is what we're getting with the other group. You have to approach it as if the other person is good. It's all in the first step. It's all in the taking the hands down. Because there may be something precious about to be said. Somebody else. If we can't figure out how to do that, and there isn't the crack in the middle where there are some people on both sides who absolutely refuse to see the other as evil. Keep going. This is going to continue. Yeah. And it has. And it has. Right. If we can't figure out how to do this, we can assume it will be these terrible confrontations and one side will feel dominated if depending on how the policy goes down, or the other side will feel dominated depending on how the policy goes down. So obviously, there has got to be some way of going forward, some sort of some policies to be introduced in which 
the, these differences, they're not going to get resolved, but we can at least have better laws. So what would that look like? Yeah, Janice. I'm not going to answer your question, just an observation about um, the Public Conversations Project and other projects that have happened like this. It always seems to me that they come out of some kind of a crisis. Yes. That, you know, there's a catalyst to sell everything, um, all of the black churches burning, yes. so many. They generate some coming together for a really effective period of time that's effective for the people, those six women involved. Right. Right. I don't, you know, I know there are other projects going on now, but what is, is there a wider ramification? Does there need to be, or do we just hope that there's lots of right. So, so Janice is saying that usually it takes some terrible moment of violence, and then there's a crisis, and people are willing to come together. And now what we're looking at is, and it, that can only perhaps work for only so long. And it may only affect the people who are directly involved. So, um, so what are we going to do? And this is, I mean, you're going to hate me when you see I'm going to ask you now in the remaining five or six minutes. We love you. Yeah, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say that, Alice? Um, so what would a good clash in post row? Okay, maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. And maybe the row decision will just stand there just fine. And, and my guess is Chief Justice Roberts is going to have strong initiatives, impulses, desire for maintaining precedent. And he's our new swing vote. So mm -hmm. I don't want to make it sound like um, this could happen. But I think it's worth us really doing this exciting, imaginative, political uh, wondering about what would a good clash look like if it goes to the states. Because this is what we could start to do. Um, what, first of all, so what do we need in the states to deliberate? What kind of information uh, will be helpful? If we were taking a Jane Addams approach, there would be lots of people going out. So she does social science in a grassroots way. I don't know if we've talked about this much when we talked about her in the first class. But her understanding of how you get information is through citizen social scientists. So she would ask people in Chicago to go out on the streets and look at the garbage situation, and then report back, and then find somebody to talk to. So maybe what we need here in this state, uh, or, and I'm going to suggest if it, goes, if it gets knocked out, it's going to go back to the states. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. So what kind of public health um, information does everybody need in order to make better laws? And what would that look like? What sort of stories? Nancy started by telling a story. What kind of stories do we need to hear? Yeah, that. Uh, I have a simple stories to tell about places where abortion was totally and completely banned. You know, Solomon, where they did exactly that, who got out that you could abort your child by drinking a lot of diesel fuel, and a lot of people did. You were automatically told you were going to jail if you tried to do that. So people not only poisoned themselves, but they got put in jail for doing that. That is a story. So Thad is suggesting stories that, like, to go, to look at other places where when uh, abortion was made illegal, what were the consequences? The one piece I would hold off on that is that then, then you're not telling a, a easily accessible shared story you're bringing in information from elsewhere. So if we want to find stories, and this is where, I don't know, I mean, I think I said in the first um, class that I find theater to be so useful, because certain stories get to be told in a certain kind of way in which the actual complexity comes to the foreground. And then people get to really wrestle with these things. And, and again, abortion is going to be the most complicated. Because a lot of these stories may be of, well, I was going to have an abortion. I was not able to get the abortion. I thought my life was going to fall apart. And now she just graduated from community college, and I'm so proud of her. And, and that's, you know, this is where time and history and the, the reality of life starts to complicate our, our thinking. So I, you know, definitely we want to have people out there gathering information and then let it be complex enough and be shared in a complex enough way that we really see these the dilemmas and how they change with time. 
But how are these conversations going to happen? Oh, won't there be cases? I think that's what's going to happen. So, so Lynn is saying, how are these conversations going to happen? Because very likely it could happen through case law, in which case there's going to be a high-profile case, and that will go through the courts, and we'll try and get law that way. Um, I'm a little suspicious about that. I think I mentioned last time, so many of you know this, Roe, Norma McCorvey, became one of the most outspoken opponents of abortion. And her sto so I'm a little worried when it just becomes uh, choreographed by the cause lawyers and not the full complexity. I have a couple more I wanted to say. you. Um, so how can we create a forum that minimizes grandstanding? That's going to be a big one. Social media is not at all helpful as a forum. And maximizes good clash. So we may need to create some spots. This is new for us. My people, my people, I'm so sad about the state of the civil education here. Not only uh, do students in, in public schools not get enough about good clash and deliberation and debate, uh, I fear that because we don't have a jury system and town meeting attendance goes down, um, that we're not getting these opportunities for these live forums where we can have these kind of conversations. But I see a, no reason to, we, why we can't start that movement. Yeah, Peter. I was just thinking that one of the problems uh, with the abortion issue is that people who have abortions and people who don't decide not to have abortions are just not willing to talk about it because it's so polarized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Peter is saying this one is so hard because people who've had or people who've thought about having or it's, it's just not something that we talk about at all. Um, did you have your hand up? Yes, yeah, Steve. <clears throat> sort of that's, that's where the, the play I've been working on begins with uh, a, an article that was in Vogue magazine with someone saying she realized that in her support group after her abortion, nobody could use the A word, uh -huh. even in a support group that was about abortion. And so the, the, you know, my aim in writing this play and, and my response to what you're saying is to make a place in which it is safe mm -hmm. to have personal storytelling. That's what a play is. Right. Um, and in order to write this play, I interviewed people with strong opinions and who had had abortions mm -hmm. and had uh, regrets or didn't have regrets mm -hmm. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is possible to listen to those stories. Right. Right. And I think that is it, to try and create a forum so that we can make it possible. The theater is so great. So Nancy and then Janice. Um, I don't want to offend the men in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe this is a woman's issue. And I think now that women are in the majority in our Congress of the United States, and it will continue to become more so rather than less so. I believe that this argument will be settled much quicker than we think, than we have thought it would, because it is about women's rights. So, so Nancy is saying that uh, because she believes that this is about women's rights and that right now there's a majority of women in Congress, she thinks it will be um, right. And, and so, and, and you know, this is where um, we're, we're going to have, a, a, again, this would be a, a place where we might have some disagreement just in terms of whose rights are they, what constitutes as a person, and, and, and are wanting to be able to resolve this. I totally get this. We want to be able to resolve this and then go on with our lives. And, and I hear, Nancy, and especially with the story you're just, you, just, you shared with us, there's that urgency in that sense, like we got to have this, we, ha we finally got it, we can't let it go, and at the same time, we have to be somehow able to be having these conversations when there's also good arguments to say this is a human concern and, um, and it has to do with all sorts of rights. I've got three hands up and a time problem. Can I do one quick thing, which is... Um, also, what does it take to stay with the pain of mistakes? And this is the last one, because I wanted everyone to understand that 
particularly it's going to be true with the other two discussions we have, feeling like there's a mistake on this issue has got a whole lot more feelings than feeling like you've had a mistake on others, and that that's going to complicate it. And I know we have several hands up, and we've only got one minute. So, and you're going to pass, and so to Joe. Um, I, just, I, think I, I jump on your idea of having, finding a forum, not social media, that could have intelligent conversations. For example, um, the information we just heard, with all due respect, Nancy, there are only 127 people in Congress, so it's not a majority yet. Yeah. 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 But, but being able to check on facts real quickly yeah. is a new thing that we have, that we didn't have before, so it's the, there's no more debates at the dining table that they used to be. Mm -hmm. Ah, so uh, this is so important. Joe is just, and this we have a, such, thank you Nancy for raising uh, uh, an issue. We try and go to facts to try and resolve things. So because uh, Joe is mentioning, because of these little devices everybody has now, you can say, how many women are there in Congress? And then you begin to say, oh, well, so that doesn't count. Uh, or as Joe is saying, then we just do facts at each other. Facts against facts against facts. And what we're trying to get at, I think, here, and why I think they were successful in Boston, is they spend much more time on their words, much more time on their approach to one another, much more time assuming they were not going to convince one another, but becoming clearer about what it is. Clearer, and here, people have been talking about religion. They said they felt spiritually and intellectually more, uh-oh, what was the term? Expanded, yeah, stronger. So um, just because we're out of time, I took us right up to the minute. I, we'll try and make it more time for questions. Feel free with the next one that we're doing on the gun debate. Um, maybe it makes sense to do a few questions, like begin the, the session next week with questions you may have about the discussion around abortion. And then we'll move on to guns. Woohoo!